So some of the key points I want to cover, I just want to share with you what the roles and responsibilities are of the area team now in terms of commissioning immunisations. Just a quick run through um, of the immunisation programmes that we started to commission last year and really give you an overview of the shingles um, vaccination programme, looking at local implementation and sharing with you some provisional coverage data that we've recently received and also looking at next steps over the coming year. So the screening and IMS team, we're employed, employed by Public Health England, but we're based with the area team in Jubilee House, um, which is the headquarters of um, NHS England's area team in Thames Valley. We've got quite a few key roles, but um, critically, we're responsible now for commissioning all NHS screening and immunisation programmes. And they're now known as Section 7A programmes because they're um, the government delegated responsibility for some public health functions to NHS England and they're now known as the Section 7A services. So our role is to make sure that we're commissioning our current services, that we implement any new service developments um, and that we ensure providers critically maintain safe and high quality services because as you know um, a service that isn't good quality and isn't safe actually can do more harm than good to our population, so that's our key role. We also assess um, variations in uptake of both screening and immunisation programmes because we want to ensure that as many eligible people as possible take up both screening and IMS uh, programmes today. So Sarah mentioned earlier, probably with a nicer slide than I have, because hers all moved around a little bit, so but I've got a photo of a child, so I think that counts for something there. <laughs> Um, we were really busy last year, as um, you all were, that as soon as we um, started as an organisation in April, um, measles became uh, quite prevalent. So we had to commission an MMR catch-up campaign for 10 to 16 year olds. And that's still ongoing at the moment. I know you're all still involved in um, really increasing uptake in that group. We know the critical issue with that really was that um, actually vaccination records in that age group isn't that accurate. So we're doing a lot of work with practices um, to imp improve that. We also launched the rotavirus um, vaccination in infants last year, and there are ongoing changes to the MENC schedule. So <coughs> one of the uh, doses uh, was removed from the infant schedule, and that's now being picked up by the school nursing service um, with the adolescent booster. So I'm going to mostly focus on shingles, but also I wanted to mention um, flu, because as you know, this year we extended the flu vaccination programme to children of two and three. And what's going to happen this year, that will extend again to four-year-olds. And in some parts of the country, that will also be piloted in, as well as some primary schools, into year seven and eight in secondary schools. So there's some work going on around that at the moment. So it was quite a busy year. So we certainly weren't twiddling our thumbs um, last year as commissioners. <clears throat> So focusing on the shingles vaccination programme, well this was launched in September last year. Like uh, most of our immunisation programmes, it's a primary care delivery model, so it's delivered through GP practices, and it's a one-off dose of um, Zostavax. The routine cohort for that is 70-year-olds, and um, at the moment we're running a catch-up cohort of 79-year-olds. And the first year of that programme will end after 12 months, um, at the end of August, then we'll roll into year two. So a quick run through of what is shingles, and I'm sure most of you are aware, it's a viral inf infection and it's caused obviously by the same virus as the um, chicken pox. Um, but as a, rec a person recovers from chicken pox, that virus then remains dormant um, within nerve cells and it can reactivate later in life, most commonly after the age of 50, but the incidence increases with age and it reactivates when a person's immune system is, um, is weakened. So, you know, your last presentation was around how immunity works. And the immune system can weaken, you know, both with age, but also um, certain diseases like HIV or certain um, treatments. So there's several reasons why um, a person can be immunocompromised. But unlike chicken box, um, shingles is not contagious at all. Um, so you can't um, transmit um, shingles between people. So a person exposed to shingles um, won't develop it. However, in some um, cases, if someone hasn't had chicken pox, 
um, as a child or a young person, and they're exposed to someone with the shingles virus, and that virus um, is at the point where the person has um, fluid-filled bis blisters, then that can transmit the virus. Mm -hmm. But it clearly isn't spread through, you know, normal routes such as coughing and sneezing. So you're wondering, you know, why do we have a vaccination program for something that isn't actually contagious? Well, it's actually quite a significant public health issue. Um, not only because of the impact it has on a person's health, but also the impacts on local health services. It's estimated through. Um, the research we've got at the moment that around 50,000 cases of shingles occur every year in people over the age of 70 and of those about a third, so around 14,000 people, um, develop a really painful condition um, called post-hepatic um, neuralgia and one, uh, 1,400 cases of shingles every year results in hospitalisation and of those around a thousand people actually die so um, one in a thousand dies, so it's around 50 cases a year. So you can see, although it doesn't affect um, that many people, the impact on health is quite significant. So what are the complications? And there's some really nasty complications of, of shingles, and they, these again increase with age. Um, the most common I've mentioned already is um, post-hepatic neuralgia, and we'll look at that in a bit more detail in a minute. People can also get secondary bacterial infections that you can treat with antibiotics. Um, less common complications include ophthalmic zoster, and the picture there is an example of that, where the infection um, can actually um, affect the facial nerves, and that can <coughs> really damage eyesight if it's not um, treated quickly. You can also get peripheral um, motor neuropathy, which is, um, can cause temporary paralysis of the limbs affected. Um, so, you know, very significant complications. The one we're most concerned about, though, obviously, and why the vaccination is so important, is um, the post-hepatic neuralgia. This is defined as pain that persists or appears for more than 90 days um, after the onset of the, the shingles rash. And in over half of those affected, um, it can persist for three to six months. It can, it can have a huge impact on um, people's quality of life. Um, it's um, more likely to develop in those over the age of 50 um, and uh, those are older so over the age of 80 um, over a third of those people can suffer from this it's very intense pain and actually it, it's not easily treated by anal analgesics at all um, and so that's why we're, we're really most concerned about this as the side effect now this table shows you the burden of disease in terms of shingles um, and you can see the older you become um, the incidence of shingles increases um, and also the percentage of people that um, develop the compl complication of post-hepatic neuralgia increases as well as does the um, percentage of people that are um, hospitalised and those that um, stay in hospital for longer so you can see that the um, severity of the condition and the impact on the person and health services increases with age. So the recommended vaccine, as I've mentioned, is Zostavax. Um, and research has shown in clinical trials um, of over 17,000 adults um, who are 70 years and older, it's a live attenuated vaccine and um, what it does, it boosts the pre-existing immunity that people already have when they've had chicken pox. Um, it isn't that effective as a vaccine in itself in preventing shingles. You can see the efficacy <coughs> is only around 38% um, and it doesn't provide protection. It's not thought for that long, so around seven years. However, it's not just the um, importance of preventing shingles, what it does do it reduces the severity of the complications. Um, so you can see it significantly reduces um, complications right by around 55%. And it also reduces um, the incidence of post-hepatic neuralgia by around 66%. So that's really important because that's what we're aiming to do with this vaccine. So it's always a balance, isn't it, between when do you give the vaccine, how do you choose the cohort um, for the vaccine, what's, what's the best time to do that. So these two graphs really illustrate um, 
the reason for why the JCVI committee uh, made the decision around just vaccinating 70 to 79 year olds. So as we know, the incidence of shingles increases with age, so you've got the arrow going up, but the efficacy of the vaccine decreases with age um, quite significantly. So all the evidence around the epidemiology, the economic evidence um, and the vaccine efficacy evidence show that that time frame between 70 and 79 is really the best time to provide the vaccination. So what have we been doing locally then in Thames Valley to implement this programme? Well, the area team, um, as soon as any information has been available from the national teams, we disseminate that locally. We realise we've actually been a bit on the back foot in the last year in that now any national information it has to be agreed and signed off by NHS England, Public Health England and the Department of Health. So that's meant actually we haven't received information quite as quickly as um, we would like to share with you. So a lot has been a little bit late in the day. Um, we share it as soon as we can and we've been delivering some primary care briefings. So last summer we worked with our Public Health England Centre colleagues, including Sarah, to deliver some face-to-face -face briefings about shingles and all the other new vaccination programmes last year. We also did some work on trying to ensure that the PGD, when it came out nationally, that we shared with you as quickly as we could and make sure that was adopted um, in practices. I think the biggest challenge with this vaccine was um, difficulties with the vaccine supply itself. There were quite a lot of difficulties over um, last uh, winter, and um, particularly between September and December, and, and it meant there was a capping of orders with practices. That was really difficult, I think, because a lot of practices wanted to align this vaccination programme with their flu vaccinations, and that didn't really work out when you can only order um, you know, a minimum number of doses every week or none at all. Um, so that, that was tricky, I think, for practices. And it also meant that we were quite constrained in our communications and media plans because we couldn't go out and, um, you know, do a lot of press um, and local media work because we obviously don't want to increase demand for a vaccine that isn't available. As the area team, we um, respond to questions about immunisations, including those around eligibility. And also, we, we're very lucky in Thames Valley that we've got the VaxLine service. And uh, looking at the database last week, it seemed that they've had um, to date around 48 queries around shingles. And most of those have been around uh, contraindications um, to the vaccine and related to queries around um, people that are immunocompromised and their eligibility to that. So how is the programme being monitored at the moment? Well, um, data on the vaccine is um, submitted through the INFORM website, similar to a lot of other of our vaccination programmes. PHE are monitoring and validating this um, data. There's monthly automatic uploads from most practices, and there are also plans for an annual survey um, after the first full year, so at the end of August, work will be und undertaken to publish that. There's also some enhanced surveillance programmes um, at the moment in some primary care practices and in some pain clinics to really monitor and evaluate the outcomes of the vaccine. So where are we in terms of progress to date? Well, the first five months of data nationally have shown that just under 350,000 doses of the vaccine have been delivered. Overall coverage um, is around 46% in the routine cohort to 70-year-olds and just under 45.5% um, well, in the catch-up cohort. It also looks like coverage is rising month on month, which is good because we were a bit concerned to start with that it may be a bit of a big bang and everyone would try and vaccinate their eligible people quite early on, um, you know, last uh, autumn. So it seems that that's now a steady increase in uptake, which is good, and also, um, most area teams have performed sim similarly, so between 40 and 50% uptake in all area teams, and I'll show you a graph in a minute to demonstrate that. A very small proportion of um, people have also been vaccinated that are outside the current eligible cohort, so those that are under the age of 70 or between um, 71 and 78. So the um, evidence at the moment shows it's about 4.3% um, of those. So this graph here shows um, uptake across all area teams, um, and this is the first five months of data. 
So for most area teams uptake is between 40 and 50 percent. There's four area teams, most of them in the uh, north of the um, country, that have achieved a little more than that. In most instances, uptake is higher in 70-year-olds than the 79-year-olds, although um, in Thames Valley that's not the case. And we're, if you can see, we're quite far over. I don't know if you can spot us. We're just here. Um, we're doing pretty well. So that's good. So we like to lead, I think, lead the pack in this sort of thing. So I'm pleased that we're, our uptake is faring well compared to others. And this is our local um, coverage data. So this is the same comparison to the first five months up to the end of January. And this shows uptake in both the cohorts um, in all our CCGs um, in the Thames Valley area. Now, our range at the moment, let me just check this, I think we go from about 40% to um, 64%. And you can see that we've got one CCG who's leading the way, and I think that's Newbury. That's interesting, because when I compared this with other vaccination programmes, the pattern's very similar. So Newbury CCG, I'm not sure what they're doing, but they're doing really well. Um, so what we want to do as an area team is find out how they're doing that and share that with the other CCGs. Not surprisingly, Slough CCG seems to have the, slow, the lowest uptake, and again, that reflects our other immunisation programmes, and that will be for a variety of reasons, including the, the population um, you know, within that CCG. So our ranges are between 40 to 63% at the moment. And um, the average for that, so this data shows that our 70-year-old uptake was at 49%, and our 79-year-old uptake was 49.9%. Now, I checked on Inform uh, yesterday, and we've got the February data in now, and it shows we're still making improvements. So our um, uptake in 70-year-olds now is at 52.7%. And in our 79-year-olds, it's now at 53.2%, so that's good. So we're showing, you know, month-on-month -month increases. The cohort in Thames Valley, um, for the 70-year-olds, it's 16,500 uh, people. And for the 79-year-olds, it's um, just over 10,000 people. So that just gives you an idea of the numbers we're looking at here. There's not much you can see from the informed data at the moment in terms of variations. It looks like both men and women are taking up the offer equally, so there's not any differences there. Um, there appears to be some variation by ethnicity, although I always treat any ethnicity data with caution at practice level, but it, looking at INFORM, it shows that it's a higher level of uptake in um, people who are from white backgrounds compared to those, for example, from black African um, uh, ethnicities. So, you know, we need to treat that with caution, but we do need to be mindful that there are going to be variations um, practices, you know, need to look at opportunities to address that. So in terms of next steps then, um, we do hope that coverage continu continues to increase over the next few months and we understand now that those vaccine supply problems have been addressed so we hope that's not going to have an impact this year on overall outcomes. What we want to do as an area team now is really work with them, you know, our, our stakeholders including primary care to develop some communication and media plans so we can really publicise the vaccination at a local level and encourage everyone who's eligible to take up the offer. We also will be you know, monitoring and sharing um, uptake data on a quarterly basis and we'll be looking at when the annual um, survey is produced. We really want to look at where the variations are, um, both in terms of localities and also in terms of age, um, gender and ethnicity look at what we can do to work with um, areas to really maximise uptake where it's um, not quite to what we would want. As far as I know, there isn't a national target um, for this programme. Um, what would be good if we, at least we could achieve the um, same uptake that we see in the um, seasonal flu programme, I think, with older people, which is around 73 to 75%. So I think if we can achieve that in Thames Valley, that would be very good. Um, obviously what we want to do uh, when this year of the programme is over, so the end of August, we'll be going into year two, so that again we'll be vaccinating 70 year olds but also uh, increasing the catch up cohort to 78 year olds as well as 79 year olds. So that's next steps. And finally, I think just to time, I want to say a very big thank you because I know it's been a huge amount of work last year with all the new programmes 
it hasn't been easy for us as commissioners and I know it certainly hasn't been easy for you as um, local services but clearly you've stepped up to the mark and you've done a great job so thank you very much.